Hi, this is Jeremy Howard, and you're listening to Coffee Time Data Science, a podcast for data science enthusiasts where I interview practitioners, researchers, and cagglers about their journey, experience, and talk all things data science. And before we begin, I apologize for the change to our schedule. Of course, usually you would be seeing Chai Time Data Science on this channel with Sanyam Bhutani. Unfortunately, he's not available today. He had a prior appointment on another podcast, and he was not able to join Chai Time Data Science. So we hope Hope you enjoy this special episode of Coffee Time and Data Science. And without further ado, I would like to invite our very special VIP guest, uh, newly anointed uh, Kaggle Grandmaster Sanyam Bhutani. Sanyam, welcome to Coffee Time Data Science. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Usually I'm very uh, anti coffee, but <laughs> I'll have to allow that. Uh, I, I still can't believe you weren't kidding. And I, I mentioned in our message also, like, I, I I think I don't deserve this, but thank you. Thank you for doing this. Of course, I couldn't say no. Oh, it's my great pleasure. Thank you for agreeing to be, you know, the uh, uh, inaugural guest on our show. And uh, I'm uh, apologies for the inappropriate choice of beverage, but, <laughs> this is, you know, this in is Australia, one... coffee is kind of our national drink, so. Actually, at, at Vogue, we were having this funny thread where people were pulling my leg when you shared the espresso uh tweet and everyone was like hey see jeremy's drinking coffee you should switch over now <laughs> i will say though i just purchased uh, three different styles of uh, oolong tea from china uh, so i also like my coffee it's very hard to find good tea here though honestly so i actually had to get it all specially imported <laughs> so you- i would certainly love to hear about your tips on um on indian tea because i'm much more familiar with the chinese variety my mom makes it for me. So every time I have a podcast, she, she makes it for me. Even today, she woke up before me. She made two chais, one like one for prep, one for now. So, Ah, great. So that's a great <laughs> tip for our listeners. If you want a nice cup of chai, head over to Sanyam Bhutani's mom's house and uh, grab yourself a, a nice cup of tea there. Um, terrific. Well, let's talk about... Um, uh, data science. And uh, as we said, I guess the um, stimulus for for um, doing this interview is your recent Kaggle Grandmaster uh, uh, anointment. Um, so why don't we start there? What are you a Grandmaster of? And how did you how did you achieve that <clears throat> lofty status? So as you can see, I, I am talking a lot and I've become a Grandmaster in the discussion sphere. So I'm only right now good at talking. Kaglers believe uh, from left to right is the hardest to easiest category. Uh, Jeremy was the first, I, I think, Kaggle Grandmaster or the first ranked in competition. So I'm trying to move towards the left end slowly and slowly. I would say data sets contributor, maybe not so hard. Like there are probably ways you could game that, I reckon. For example, I bet if I put all the data sets from the course on Kaggle, I would become a data sets Grandmaster. <laughs> Uh, I'm one gold away from being a Colonel's Grandmaster, um, which I should definitely uh, get back to doing Colonel's because they're so fun. Like I, I um, so when I uh, ran the Master's Machine Learning course at USF, I actually uh, the the marking for the course was based on how many points you got on Kaggle competitions. Uh, Kaggle discussions and Kaggle kernels, and I always kind of said to That's them, awesome. if you can, yeah, if you can write in a way that people find compelling, explain data science in a way that people find useful, or build models that are highly predictive, then you've got a good, uh, good um, opportunities ahead of you. So, I, I think sometimes kernels are a bit flaky. So I've been spoiled with uh, this box, and like I'm so used to things running instantly. Uh, sometimes I get a bit annoyed, but uh, People sharing stuff on there is awesome, and I always learn so much. Every time I go on the kernel stuff, the Kaggle community makes it super awesome. And what's the flaky bit? I'm just used to run, uh, running cells super fast. Like Kaggle kernel takes oh, you mean longer the to start. Environment. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I treat it as a platform for communicating to people rather than, yeah, rather than a compute environment, for sure. So, um, so what are you up to when you're not... Um, being useful on Kaggle discussions. So where are you working now? 
I work at Weights and Biases and we have an awesome fast day culture internally as well. Uh, it's it's like working with friends, uh, working on side projects with friends. So I lead our community efforts, which basically means I just do what I love. I host live stream for the broader community, our CEO, Lucas Beaverd, whom you know, and our head of growth, Lavanya, whose team I work on. Both of them are super supportive of community stuff so they just let me do whatever i want uh every time i go with like a stupid idea to lavanya uh, taking a stupid idea to her she's like this sounds good to me if it sounds good to you just go ahead with this so i get to do what i love and for some reason they pay me for it yeah well lucas is a super awesome being a human being and uh also a very smart guy so uh, i know a lot of the fast ai community have made their way over to weights and biases and hopefully are doing positive things in that company, which is always, already going very well. Um, and I know it's uh, actually in terms of all of the logging frameworks and deep learning, it's it's the best integrated with the fast AI library and um, I, the most loved by some degree, which I guess is why it's the, the best integrated. So um, actually genuinely a, a good product. Um, now, I first came across you when I think when you posted a message in the fast AI forums a few years ago, introducing yourself and saying you were interested in learning about deep learning. Now remind me when, when would that have been? What year? I, I'm so sorry, just to add one small point to your previous Please. question. Uh, when I was interviewing for Weights and Biases, I showed this to Lucas and I was going ahead and explaining why I spent so much time on our forums and he just, he stopped me there. He was like super appreciative of this. So he instantly recognized that I'm from Fast AI and uh, right. now I get to work on the best uh, experiment tracking tools uh, team. But sorry, to answer your question, I got the opportunity to join the international fellowship in 2017. I was really struggling with university. I mean, I was doing okay with my grades. So but, what were you studying at university? I This is one of my like most controversial uh, messages I put out. I was studying computer science, but I wasn't becoming a better programmer, which is how right. I envisioned it to be. And what university was that? That was SRM University. So it's uh, one of the good known universities in India. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went there expecting to just become better at programming and I just didn't like the syllabus. I was trying every single thing. I was signing up for every student club and I just couldn't enjoy it. And then I shifted to online courses, was trying to find something interesting there. And somehow magically I landed on fast day, although initially I was terrified of it. But for some reason, so I, I decided like, to continue. So let me just dig in a little bit more because I'm very interested because I think a lot of people watching will be people who, like a lot of data scientists or people doing data science don't have a computer science background. And I think a lot of them, you know, I certainly used to be like this, looks over at the computer science world and thinks like, oh, I I probably should have done a computer science degree. Maybe I should go back to university. You know, I'm never going to understand anything. I'm not a real computer scientist. So you're saying that's not necessary. And in fact, you're saying you didn't learn much useful programming. So like, tell us more. What, what were you doing in the computer science course? What were you learning? And in what way was it? not satisfying one of the things i learned afterwards uh, was it's any computer science degree is more of double ecs so electrical engineering and computer science so half of it is just learning about diodes stuff like that and that was absolutely terrifying to me i had no interest in it at all i, I just like barely passed in that subject i remember going to the professor and just like asking them hey please don't fail me in this i don't want to take this class again <laughs> does that work <laughs> Is he like, okay, I'll pass you? Worked for a few subjects for me. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I looked at the programming courses. First year uh, syllabus in India is usually just the basics of everything. So they teach you chemistry. They even teach you biology and computer science. And I just didn't like it. I decided right. to go to the library. I would pick out the senior year books. I would hang out in the section with all the sophomores who were hanging out. Mm. And they were doing teenage stuff there. I was the only one with a book in the library in a corner. And even that, that was very outdated syllabus. So it was just very mundane stuff. And I couldn't see the like stuff connecting to real world. So I would talk to people on the internet. They were building amazing stuff. And I just didn't like see the connect happening at all. 
Yeah, I mean, I remember, so I, I ended up majoring in philosophy at university, but I did try many things along the way to try and find something that seemed more interesting. And I, <clears throat> I did do a computer science subject, uh, what was it called, like, uh, oh, I can't remember what it's called, it's like a programming and statistics class. And that programming was in Pascal. Um, and I didn't understand any of it, which I found kind of surprising because I knew how to code, you know, and I actually, and I remember going, I, I found that textbook 10 years later and I went back and I reread it and I was like, I, even though I know, like I've written production software in Pascal at that point in Delphi, I still didn't understand the book. And I realized like, okay, the problem is not me. The problem is the book. Like a lot of academics just aren't good teachers you know um they make things just so hard to understand that realization came so late to me like I, I, two years into the degree but still like that was super late for me i was just expecting my teachers to be super good at everything and i would like go to them with questions sometimes i just wouldn't get answers and that would really annoy me like how do they not know this like they're supposed to know this stuff yeah. i remember in like one of my machine learning courses uh there was a course of, uh, there was a question in an exam about what's the latest here and i had read a paper i drew that architecture i was super proud about that and i got a zero because they said this is not in the syllabus you're not supposed to write this oh no yeah oh my god <laughs> i mean it's not just university honestly my daughter is 6 and so she's doing primary school and it's same issues you know they're like you're only allowed to be covering this part like so we're talking about fractions but you're only allowed to talk about halves and if you mention quarters you know you're going to get told to stay <laughs> stay in your lane it's it's bonkers yeah um so so you were looking for for other material for other things that might help you learn like more pragmatic how to code, how to become a good programmer. And so that it was during that search that you came across fast AI. I first found machine learning and then I tried like, I used to proudly say to my peers because it was like a status symbol to me, just the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? I was like at the initial bit and I would just tell them proudly, hey, I did like 40 online courses and then I would go ahead and sign for five more. So this and is like, like Coursera I, or Udemy or stuff like that? Every single thing, you name it, I probably would have like at least watched five minutes of it and then like, mm. did nothing. Mm. And I, I, I wrote an article, How Not to Do Fast AI, where I would say, I would discover something, find a course, study the course and not be able to build something. And uh, during the search, somewhere in between, I found Fast AI and I signed up for Fast AI, luckily. Mm. So, yeah, so what was that? experience like did that like was that different to other courses you're taken i could feel like this was the first time i felt that i could build stuff that like actually works so it's That's not cool. just like those three layered neural networks i'm like and i remember in the first uh two lectures you showed us how to get started on a kaggle competition right. you put out a simple baseline and we were beating you so i remember like me and my roommate were taking the course together and we both were jumping for like 10 minutes. Hey, we're, we're ahead of Jeremy. Like, how is this happening on the leaderboard? So here is the aforementioned how not to do fast.ai, which I I do remember. It's very, very helpful. And I've shared this with other people. And I think um, Radek has also uh, shared some of these ideas. Um, it, it, it's interesting to me... Um, um, yeah, it's interesting, like, how few even machine learning courses are top down. So, you know, I, I always feel like if you're not creating useful models reasonably quickly, then that's pretty discouraging. And also, like, how are you going to know what's the point of the stuff you're learning about if you're not actually training useful models? It seems like it's pretty hard to integrate the knowledge that you're being taught. Um, all of the courses yeah. would, sorry. Go on. Uh, all of the courses would like, now Now most of them are better, but at that time they would start with showing this super cool style uh, style transfer example. And then they would like go back to just teaching the mundane stuff. Right. Here's how you like do stuff in NumPy. 
and right. I, I was like so done with it at that time and right. first day was like super awesome because there was also this insane community and usually when you take a course you're in a similar cohort which is one thing i didn't like about university like no one around me was talking about machine learning they they thought i'm like super weird i thought they're super weird but on right. first day like we had what were they insane... wanting to do like if they're not interested in ml what what are, what were their hopes and plans and interests just do teen it stuff <laughs> I see. I mention. Okay. so it wasn't just ml but it's more just actually studying and learning effectively in general uh yeah and most of them were like just building websites i didn't enjoy that bit at all i would just okay. like download templates and hack stuff together every time yeah. i wanted to do that yeah yeah building websites is not particularly intellectually interesting of itself necessarily for sure um so yeah tell me about okay so so you got started and you said 2017 right so how did that go from there was that then all smooth sailing or did you hit any obstacles along the way like anything that in hindsight you wish you had done differently so uh you you'd already pointed to my article and i also was asking this question when i had the opportunity to interview rachel because i'm so new to top down learning still like in my entire student life which is 15 years i've been studying in the bottom up way and i was so new to mm. top down i would like always default to that so my right my issue was like not listening to you enough like the success i have was because i listened to you 10% of the time and other time i would just like okay this is not working i need to like go and read the basics or uh, again default to bottom up learning so th- yes that was like, exactly like redekosmowski he says the same thing yeah we we both also talk a lot about this uh he he even we like spoke about this for half an hour when i had the chance to interview him uh, and even in this book i think this is really a struggle because we always start with like aspiring to be someone and then we don't want to like uh, put in a lot of effort initially and you don't see the dot connecting immediately although like it takes an insanely long amount of time so can i ask and feel free not to answer if this is too private but how, how old were you in 2017 when you joined the fast ai community uh so 5 years ago i was 19 19 okay cuz like i ask because i um you you definitely stood out to me even then you know like and i couldn't exactly tell you why or how but you certainly came across as you know unusually motivated now i will say that's not that unusual there's plenty of people who join the course sounding pretty motivated but then i would say like the big difference with you the really big difference with you is your tenacity like you you didn't go away like you know <laughs> like if the multiple 100,000 people who start the course you know seeing it through over a multiple year period and doing the things like i remember you would even post on the forums and say like you know in order to have something to force myself to live up to i'm going to tell you what i'm going to do over the next few months like um there it is um what do you have a sense of like what's how did you get to this point why are you more tenacious than the average bear and and you know what's kind of helped you to stick with it and to follow through on your goals you you being too nice to me so like i i would go away from fast day because i was like maybe only jeremy can do this stuff i'm not like as good as you of a programmer i'm not as good as you are reading papers so i would like go away to other courses time to time and again like realize no i i want to come back to the community and uh, just a mad passion of really believing that if i stick to this would be really helpful uh, one thing i've learned is like we always start aspiring to be some person as i was saying and we like we're like always looking at that end goal but instead i've over time learned to really enjoy the process more so like when i was trying to lose weight i was like uh, that was my fifth attempt <laughs> at losing weight this time what made it stick was i i would just show up every day and walk for like 2 hours straight like no no excuses just walk for 2 hours for at least 4 months and then i started losing weight so 
broadly speaking i just learned to appreciate the process of showing up every day and just uh, doing yeah it. okay that's great advice you know um is to focus on the process so i had a similar experience gosh how long ago seven or eight years ago when i decided to try to improve my fitness and i started going to crossfit like crossfit was literally a block away um and i had really never done any kind of intense training in my life and crossfit you die very quickly into intense <laughs> training and you know each day i just felt awful you know i can't begin to tell you how much i hated it and how bad i felt and the other thing that made it difficult was like everybody else at crossfit is just so like gung ho about it so i i think i must have felt a bit like you were like oh jeremy's better at coding than me and i can't do it it's like okay these people are all crossfit people but yeah you know uh, it helped to have rachel actually because we both decided to go every day so we're like okay we're going to go every day i think it was like 5 30 a.m turn up hate it go home turn up hate it go home and after about th- similar time i reckon about three months i was like i still hated it but i didn't feel horribly sick every time you know i was just like uncomfortable and a little painful you know yeah it's it's hard isn't it because like to get stuff out of these any of these things you have to turn up to the process for months and those those months are often not much fun crossfit is also super hard you like uh, in one day you get super exhausted and next day you have to show up again half exhausted you like thinking results aren't coming in what do i do yeah and i mean so like when we're learning stuff i think in university it often seems to be the prof- professors are proud of this you know like weed out classes they're like oh 80% of my class flunked out and it's like well you're you're a shit teacher aren't you you know like you want to be giving people positive real positive feedback all the time of like oh wow you, you just trained a model oh wow you just fine tuned a model oh wow you just created a web application like it's that's how computer games work you know with computer games you don't like start up grand turismo 7 and it's like dumps you straight into an f1 car on nurburgring and asks you to you know qualify for you know um F1. It's like, okay, we'll start with license test and I don't know, <laughs> Ford Focus. Can you drive in a straight line for 50 yards or something? And at the end it's like, "Congratulations, gold medal. You've done it. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to like show you how to do it and you have to press the brake pedal yourself." It's like, "Congratulations, you did it." I think so, but, yeah. But one of the like uh things I learned through gaming, I used to game a lot. I would like sit down and game straight for 16 hours. My parents weren't happy about it, but like 16. I would just fight and Whoa. Okay. I would fight and make that happen. In in games, we call it grinding, where you like have to do this so stupid stuff over and over again that just yeah. doesn't make sense. But you enjoy it so much, and like uh, just I think many Kagglers see this that like bringing that over to Kaggle because initially you just suck on the leaderboard. I still suck on the leaderboard. I'm a like bad competitor, but you enjoy the process so much because it's it's the grind that you start enjoying towards the. Now you say that but I don't think that's true because you've had some very good results in competitions haven't you? I had the chance to team up with awesome people so I was okay. I was learning oh. from them and oh, contributing ideas. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Now the other thing I noticed with you is in terms of follow through is you know we often encourage people to kind of put themselves out there build their personal portfolio blog whatever um everybody says they're going to not many people do and it's uh, it's hard i know like you've talked about how for example this podcast when you started no one's listening <laughs> you know it's just you talking <laughs> out to the empty internet i like, give me a sense of like what did that feel feel like to like you know write blog posts when you didn't have a readership create podcasts when you didn't have listeners like what did that feel like and how did you push through and then how did how did you get people to start noticing you i i'll start with the tangent i think uh, great people improve and like they reach heights greater people keep uh, they uplift others and greatest people keep 
uh, reaching higher heights in life and keep uplifting others so people like you and the kaggle community and fast hair community are the greatest because you keep uplifting others also my my blog got a lot of traction in the podcast because you and the community were sharing it so much but it was it was like super bad for me uh, as as you might know i'm i'm like extremely sincere towards anything i try and like i give it my best otherwise i like just wouldn't sign up for anything that's that's how it is now initially it was in the case I and well, hang on, tell us felt- more about that tell us more about that what do you mean so so i mean that's just such an interesting point so you're saying na- nowadays when you try you really try but that wasn't always the case T- tell me more no. <laughs> i would just like bail halfway through like three days into it uh one month into anything i would just bail uh when i was trying to lose weight in university i would like work out i worked out for one month super intensely so i decided i would climb we had super tall buildings so like 15 16 floors and i used to live on the ninth floor of the hostel out of this like nowhere i decided i'll climb 60 floors every day at least 50 to 60 floors i did that for <laughs> one month damaged my knees a bit and then i just like gave up i didn't like start slow and build up right so i so what I, happened I, you just like you you became more mature or was there some kind of like conscious decision or i, I think maturity yes i i'm still not very mature but now now i like start slowly and like remain uh, remain at anything i do okay uh, so so sorry so go on so you're very you're, so at the point you started the podcast you were sincere about putting your effort in and yeah go on uh yeah uh, so when when like i got to interview you or other kagal grandmasters to me it felt like i'm i'm being insulted towards uh, people like you because it's not getting to a large enough audience and i felt like that's my job to like if i'm asking for someone's time i need to like put it out there and that part was super super annoying to me like how can i this is something i'm putting out to the best of my ability and how can i like not get it to the audience that i think it deserves right so i had how did you uh, and yeah i mean like even just to put out that next podcast or that next blog post how, yeah how did you convince yourself to, to kind of do it anyway and and then did that audience like just gradually trickle in more and more or was there something that was like suddenly you got noticed or but yeah what happened Uh, I learned this from Radek Osmalski he would post his goals and that's that's what I started copying so uh, from him I started as you mentioned I now post my goals every single year also I just now I also make a video about it so that like everyone no I I'm I'm terrified then like I I think everyone's watched that video now I need to like do that and I switched from thinking about what's the outcome to like uh, I'm going to when I was doing the podcast I decided I'll put out two episodes every single week no matter what for like an entire year and i just decided to do that and i wasn't so much so looking at how many people are watching although i would like pay some attention to it and instead i would just like focus on making the best version of the podcast every single week or before that i was writing blog posts and uh, i committed to writing one blog post at least every week and i was just making sure i can write anything best to my ability at that time so here is a uh... Radex book where uh yeah uh highly recommended for um he he's had a lot of success and has a lot of great tips so I thought I better just share that since we've both been talking about Radex a little um yeah it's what you describe you know which is like just trying to do a better job you know to to get there it requires a certain amount of kind of like trust in the system that that there is some reasonable relationship between working hard and getting good results you know um which i think is not obvious you know like it's not obvious that that's true um and so and if you don't believe that's true then it's it's going to be very rough you know um because it's just going to feel like well why why bother i guess you know um actually i i want to share something which is um i to give a sense that, that it is true um and so i mentioned earlier that i'm close to being a kaggle colonel's grandmaster 
um, here is the last few Kaggle kernels that I've uploaded. And you can see every single one of them has got a gold medal, um, which is to say, like, I put my all into creating the very best Kaggle kernel I could. Um, and yeah, it's like, and, and, and each time I have done that, um, people have reacted to that by upvoting and, and liking my Kaggle kernel, you know? And so like, I think like, if that doesn't happen, it's important to self-reflect, you know, same in a competition, a Kaggle competition. Like I like these transparent metrics because you you can't bullshit yourself about them like i mean you can but you shouldn't it's like okay if, if you don't get likes on your kaggle kernel you should assume because it's because you didn't do a good enough job you know you didn't explain it well enough or you didn't make it compelling enough or it wasn't a particularly good approach you know if you sucked in the private leaderboard you shouldn't assume you just were unlucky but that that you know this is an opportunity for you to learn how to to do better. Uh, so, sorry to disagree a bit, but initially there's like always this uh, period of suck where things wouldn't just pick up, it, at least on Kaggle also, when you're just putting out stuff or kernels, I think it, it takes a while for people to start voting it. So I, I would also like get- Well, that's true. Disheartened. They do have to notice you. Not in competitions, yeah. you know, <laughs> not in competitions. Yeah. I mean, certainly in podcasts and blogs and things, it's it's very different. It's like, trickles up very very slowly like people often ask me how to get more twitter followers and i'm just like just tweet <laughs> like just you know and to try to make good ones like i started with zero followers and then one and then two and you know um and it always goes very very slowly um i share this one thing from uh, my so this this is titled as my first kaggle competition experience and on the leaderboard, as I you like mentioned, like, name. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a story behind it. We were so naive. We were trying to uh, rename stuff and my teammate ended up cleaning up my entire laptop with that command. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is how the first competition felt like. I was looking at the Kaggle Grandmasters and it was like, they're, they're on a supercar. I'm running barefoot and it's a hundred mile sprint. I can't keep up with them. I would submit to the leaderboard. Uh, sleep some and as i wake up i would have fallen down 50 positions i would come back try it again exactly keep doing that every day and like i, I finished in the top 20 percent i think which also fantastic. was like super awesome to me fantastic and again that's like tenacity right like most people aren't going to keep coming back and in my experience the people who do come back make it you know like it's i feel like this is the number one difference between those who succeed and those who, who don't. Um, but yeah, coming back to your point about, like, for example, getting people to upvote your kernels um, or, or to watch your podcasts, I guess what we're saying is having extremely good content is a necessary but not sufficient condition for success. So you do need to make sure that you're telling people about your Kaggle kernels or about your blog posts or about your podcast episodes. But if you get people to look and they're not extremely good, they're not going to come back and look again. One thing I have, and uh, to, to credit, uh, the blog started through Rachel's advice. I would just read it uh, every week at least once and I would sincerely follow her advice on uh, how to get started on blogging. It's an amazing blog post that she's written. That's how I got started there. And I would just transfer my learnings to the podcast also. But the podcast was like super bad in quality during the initial weeks. But at the time, that was the best I could do. And one thing I've learned is I try not to spam too much with like sharing it over and over again. So every time I've done a podcast, I've only shared it once with the world. And I, if I reshare it, it's because it's so relevant. I say, hey, please listen to this. This is where I discuss this. But I'm also like extremely sincere about not spamming the community although like i do spam with my tea puns and tea jokes just for the sake of branding but i try not to spam too much with like any stuff i'm building 
So this is uh, Rachel's blog post, which I, I've heard what you just said. I've heard it from so many people <clears throat> that they this is what got them blogging. And you know what um, a lot of folks might not realize is Rachel, you know, she's she's a math PhD. She's an academic. Um, it, the, the idea of putting yourself out there like that is an absolute anathema to her academic training, you know, and, and, you know, in the academic community, which I'm also in nowadays. Yeah. It's, um, it's almost looked, it's, it is, it's looked down upon, you know, of like communicating in a clear way that the rest of the world can understand, which is, it's, it's such a shame, you know? And so it does require a pretty conscious decision. I think particularly if you're at university to be prepared to be different, um, because the people teaching you and supervising you have probably never written a blog post in their life and they probably have no idea what it really is. And they're trying to get you to write the most obtuse academic jargony prose in extremely exclusive PDF only academic papers. <laughs> you know? So, um, so tell me more about like, um, creating educational content in general. What What's the kind of educational content that you're finding is really gelling with people, that people are telling you, thank you so much for creating that, that made a difference to me? I'm still surprised when people say that to me. I'm like, I'm just creating this for my own self. I just follow Rachel's advice, which is uh, to create something that I wish was there. And that's how I started the podcast. Also, I was talking to so many incredible people on Fast Day. Uh, Tuatini, who used to take the course, he taught me how to get started in freelancing. And I, I would always shamelessly ask question. I would always start with an apology. Hey, sorry, this is going to be a super stupid question, but I want to ask this to you. <laughs> that's that's and I would like just shamelessly approach people ask these questions that's how the podcast also got started so I'm just trying to fill the gaps that I think uh exist we have all I mean, something I learned something I learned in my 20s is yeah that um, which you've obviously already discovered is that those embarrassingly stupid questions are the questions that lots and lots of people want to ask, but they assume everybody already knows. And so they end up never getting <laughs> asked and everybody's like, ah, we really don't know. So, you know, speaking personally, when somebody asks me those questions, I'm always very grateful because I'm always like, ah, that's a, that's a good point. I hadn't, you know, like, particularly if you're an expert on something, you don't really think to mention it until somebody asks you the question. Yeah, I, I've been super blessed that people have been so nice and they always share the knowledge like they've shared it privately with me and also like now on the podcast they've been sharing it. So I'm I'm super lucky in that way. Have there been things that have surprised you either that have been very popular that you didn't expect or some things that you thought like, oh, this is going to be big and they didn't really go anywhere? Uh Honestly, I, I started with the arrogance of like a uh, 20 year old. Hey, people will listen to this. I know this is awesome. Everyone should listen to this. This will be the number one data science podcast in next year. No one listened to it. And then I realized as, as I got a bit more mature uh, that it's super hard to get people to click on an hour long video on YouTube alongside with mm. everything else that exists mm. on there, especially stuff that's like super technical, super knowledge heavy. Now I feel super grateful that people thousands of people listen to the podcast they click download they click on youtube so now now, yeah, now i, I think, feel like yeah and i think people are like i think it's underappreciated how much people do want that kind of content like you know you look at something like lex friedman's podcast and it's not flashy you know like it's it's well produced in that lex spends time on like he has high quality equipment and he sets it up carefully and he does it in person. But, you know, his actual interviews is just like him asking questions, generally fairly brief questions to somebody who's generally highly technical, listening to the whole answer, rinse and repeat for one and a half hours. And it's, you know, lots of people do actually end up tuning in because they're, you know, not everybody, but there are people out there who want high quality 
not dumbed down content. I I remember watching his uh, inter- your interview on his podcast, and I thought no way you you're going say uh, you you'll say yes to me, and when when I said I want to fill the missing gaps, that's what I meant. That I I whenever I do a podcast for your case, I listen to every single interview, every single AMA you've done, and then I would ask the questions that weren't discussed there. So just try to bring those things out, and not always start with the repetitive questions that many people do. That's uh, a great same- actually. That's a great point. Um, because Lex does that too, you know, and um, I don't do many interviews at all. Like I, I did one with Lucas, you know, who runs Weights and Biases. I did one with Lex. I mean, hardly anything else. Like, and in both cases, Lex and Lucas, like, just had done their homework so well. And so the questions they asked were genuinely interesting. And so do the kinds of people who are interested in my thoughts in Korea. It's going to be interesting to them because it's just, it's not just like, oh, who are you? What do you do? It's like, oh, I'll do this thing called fast AI. And, you know, anybody who knows me doesn't want to hear more about just like what's fast AI. They know what's fast AI. So, you know, what you're describing, it's how everybody should do it, but hardly anybody does. You know, <laughs> um, and you know, probably a lot better for you as well, right? Because in the process of doing that research, you're going to learn about stuff. I, I personally feel maybe it's because of my culture and upbringing. It's also insultive to the other person to ask like very basic questions. Like if if I interview you and ask, "Hey, Jeremy, can you please introduce yourself?" I won't do that. That's that's my job. I should be asking oh. the interesting questions to you and uh, to I anyone that ins- I. I think it's insulting in our culture too, but people still do it. <laughs> so, but anyway, good on you. I mean, something I do want to ask about, um, which I definitely remember, is the excitement that you shared about having the opportunity to interview for. Um, for a residency at Google. And uh, and I, th- I think, you know, the community was excited for you as well because it's like, well, you know, good stuff, Sanyam. This is going to be great. And then it didn't happen. <laughs> you know, tell us a bit about that. Like, what did it feel like? Like, how did you get that offer, you know, to, to interview for, for Google? What did you do to prepare? You know, what did it feel like to fail at that, you know, at that journey? And and how did you, you know, push on from there? And what did you do with that experience? I was crying at 2am when I got the email that I had okay. been rejected. Yeah. <laughs> so, and my, and I, uh, I, I used was... the word fail very intentionally, right? Because that, that's what it, that's what it is. And that's what it feels like. And it's like, okay, I've worked this. I, I failed, you know, and that's like, you know, it's, let's not use bullshit work words about whatever it's like when we fail how do you yeah how does it feel how do you get up so you i bet you were crying middle of the night probably felt like that's it right you tried so hard to get here it didn't work you're not good enough is that kind of the feeling you're having in your head uh yeah and the the point i was like getting to was also that i was again so distant to my peers. I remember telling my friends, hey, I interviewed at Google AI residency and they failed me. And they just say, cool, okay, you'll you'll get it next time. Like they, they couldn't yeah. appreciate how big of a thing yeah, it that's was. Hard. Yeah. And that's that's why I'm really grateful to Fast AI community. When I shared that, hey, I'd failed and uh, I've done bad for the community because I couldn't get through. Everyone was like super supportive. Mm. That instantly got me to getting back. And in fact, that's how I started the podcast. I decided, okay, now I'm 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 going to help the community to at least get to the point of interviewing and hopefully Fantastic. someone gets through. Fantastic. So you know, that's I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of genuinely important outcomes. But I mean, how how did you get there in the first place? You know, like like you say, you come from a community where nobody even knows what you're doing, let alone gives a shit about it. How did you find yourself flying to America to Google? I just, uh, I found this courage through applying through Fastway. I didn't expect to get into the course even. And since then, I've just uh, find, found the courage constantly to shamelessly apply, shamelessly ask for help. So just 
uh, stepping out of my comfort zone i am i'm very inherently shy i've been shy all my life but now mm-hmm. on the internet i'm i'm less shy and i just apply to every position even in my undergrad i would start applying to positions that i knew were clearly out of my league and my goal was to just get to the interviewer and ask them hey how do i like actually get through this interview and i, I never got a clear response at that time but i just got uh, to the extent where i could comfortably apply to things i didn't expect to go through right and every time you do that you know there's a chance you'll fail right and so but if you don't apply then you always fail so yeah i mean you know i i'm the same i'm i am i am introverted and shy and i remember telling my friend chris latner that a few months ago and he was just like sorry that's like I, I, the same, I am. The same and it's like that can't be true. And it's like here's all the things you do. And it's like I know, and they're all terrifying. And after it, I'm exhausted, <laughs> and I do it anyway. Um, yeah, it, it. You know, you have to. You have to put do it anyway, don't you? You know, because otherwise, you'll always fail because you never give yourself the chance to succeed. Yeah, and. just just staying at it i think at agreeing to the fact that initially i of course at that time didn't believe that i i can't get a job just because i was so arrogant in my head hey i'm ahead of my classmates of course i should get a job and india is a big country it's very populated there's there's a huge amount of competition here mm. so i of course wouldn't get the jobs and i would continue in my arrogance somewhat in my tenacity to continue talking to people continue applying left and right yeah So okay, so um, so you started the podcast, um, and um, you know what what happened? What was the next commercial opportunity you got, and how did you how did you make that happen? I I started it inspired by you, where I decided not to monetize it, which wasn't the best decision because I was investing my money and not getting any returns. My parents were definitely upset. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, uh, but I, I I didn't mean it in that way. So initially, I uh, I, uh, I started the podcast, and uh, then someone at H two O, H two O AI, it's an awesome company, shared my oh, podcast internally. They were like. this guy is interviewing everyone i want to interview people at our company but he's interviewing them before i do wow. <laughs> that made the ceo uh, reach out to me the ceo of h2 decided i want to hire this guy and then right. i got it to do as part of my day job so and he's another indian guy right if i remember correctly yes yeah cool so insanely that's how the dots connected and uh, th- through any job i have had this is i think the fourth stint in my career it's always been through the fast a community directly or indirectly i feel um yeah no i mean that's that's actually amazingly kind of direct is like your personal branding i mean not that unusual though you know your personal branding efforts was the thing that made people not only know who you are but you know that you're doing something that's so good like that's literally what they were wanting to do themselves um that's amazing um okay i have reached the end of my questions uh did you have anything either that we haven't covered you'd like to cover or is there anything that you would like to ask me before we wrap up the inaugural coffee time data science uh, episode I would ask you for advice. What do you, as my as my guru and my teacher, what do you expect me to do next? What do you want me to do next? That'll that'll make you happy. Oh no, I I never have opinions. You know, I try to like, I try to kind of say like, here's how you can move in a direction that you want to head. You know, like I don't have any sense of like what direction should anybody head. Um, I mean, hopefully. in a direction that's at least not destructive to society and that you've got the tools and thought processes in place to think about how to to help society but like you I mean you're doing exactly what I would have thought makes perfect sense which is to surround yourself with not just good people but people who who appreciate you and value you for who you are and what you do um you know and particularly you know in a in a in a geography where that 
isn't going to happen just by virtue of the people who happen to live down the street, you know. Um, you know, the only thing I kind of tell people of around your age is you could you could consider changing your geography at least for a year or two. Like for me personally, um, one of the few regrets I have in my life is that I didn't do that. You know, I um, growing up in Melbourne, uh, very different to India, but but in some ways, you know, it, it's got some similarities and it. it's a long way away from, you know, at least kind of culturally and in, and in Australia's case, geographically from, anything like the kind of stuff that I was interested in and nobody in my life cared about anything that I was interested in. And uh, that made me feel like uh, there was something wrong with me, you know, like, like I was weird and that was a problem. And, and, you know, people would sometimes fairly directly give me that feedback, you know, <laughs> that sounds uh, very similar to my experience also. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So going to San Francisco to me, like there's a lot of, of things I don't love about the US in general and San Francisco in particular, but it was such a confidence building exercise to be surrounded by people who were interested in what I did and did try to do similar things themselves and um, and to also realize that the people that I admired and looked up to were not on some other level of existence. They went on some other plane, but they would, you know, they made mistakes and had setbacks and redoubled their efforts and just normal people, you know? And so I kind of thought like, okay, I'm, yeah, they're just other people like me and I can um, do interesting things like they're doing. And like, I'd always wanted to do interesting things like they were doing, I guess. Um, so that'd be the one thing like to consider. And I'd say like a couple of years in a invigorating culture full of people that respect the kind of work you do can be, of, can be a value. It's not possible for everybody, you know, and honestly, it wasn't really possible for me for most of my life. So it's not really a regret in that it wasn't something that I had access to, um, or something I wish I had access to. Um, and it's definitely not needed. Like you can totally do it all as you, you've shown online. Um, but it's, yeah, it's something to consider if it's, if it's, if it's an option. Thank you. No, now, now I've gotten to the stage where it's somewhat possible. Uh, I'll try to explore that option, but, uh, but before we wrap up, I also want to really thank you for all the knowledge you've been sharing with the community. Your your interview will always be pinned on my channel. This is the 150th uh, episode on the podcast, but I'm, I'll always be grateful to you and the community. All of, all of my small achievements are through Fast Day. So th thank well, you so much. It's, for... <clears throat> it's actually the first episode of Coffee Time Data Science, but I know what you mean. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you, we'll let you uh, keep it as the 150th. <laughs> <laughs> you're more than welcome and you know thank you because i mean you've um given back so much to the community so um i know so many people are grateful to you so thank you they've been too kind just just to add one more thing i i know i've i have a lot to learn still i've gone off on this tangent of creating content and i feel like an imposter that is only a discussions grandmaster is only a competition expert and that knowledge needs to transfer somehow. So I know I have a lot to learn still and uh, the imposter syndrome is taking over, but I'll... Wow, you're slowly... still young. You'll get there. <laughs> Thank you, mate. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Bye.